Well, our next speaker is a two-time chess champion and author. Please welcome Jen Shahadi. How many moves do you think I had? How many moves could you beat me in? What was your shortest game? I bet you could checkmate me in four moves, couldn't you? These are some of the questions that people ask me when they find out that I play chess. When Bill Gates played against our new world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen, the press latched onto similar questions. The game was 79 seconds long, nine moves. And yes, Magnus did win. But to get to the heart of mastery and chess mastery and chess thought, instead we should ask, how do you think? Or what does it look like when you think? When I won my first US Women's Chess Championship title, it was also the first year that men and women were combined into the same section for this tournament. The event was held in Seattle, right next to the Space Needle. In my critical victory, I played against an international master who was originally from Armenia. The night before the game, I studied the first moves of the game. It's also called the opening. And I selected the Grunfeld, which was also popularized by world champions Gary Kasparov and Bobby Fischer. So I played the first moves of my game very quickly. And then on move 14, I, I sank into a really deep thought, so deep that my legs fell asleep. I thought for almost 30 minutes. Finally, I made my move, and the variations that I was thinking about showed up on the board. And it was crucial that I thought at that moment because there was a trick on move 20 that if I hadn't seen, might have turned a win into a loss. In fact, I, I won after 23 moves. And what struck me later about this game was that my thought process was not actually that difficult, but that identifying the right moment to think was what won me victory. When chess players encounter these types of tough spots, we craft what we call decision trees. So first we think about all of our top choices. Should I move my king? Should I move my knight? Should I move my rook? Then we consider our, our opponent's counters to those moves. If I move my king, what if he moves his rook? What if he moves his bishop? What if he moves his knight? Then we consider replies to those counters. And as you can see, the tree gets wild and it's very difficult to calculate it all. In another game that I play poker, there are also decision trees, although they tend to be a lot shorter since poker hands don't last as long as a chess game. Also, on any point in a poker hand, you can fold, which ends the decision tree. You move on to the next hand and the next potential decision tree. Similarly, in chess, sometimes our decision trees are more like a stump. And that's because there's only really one reasonable option. For instance, in this position, my opponent just took my most valuable piece, the queen. The queen is the most powerful piece in the chessboard by far. So the only reasonable thing for me to do is recapture the queen. No decision tree because only one option. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. It's difficult to craft a decision tree because there's actually too many options. For instance, maybe we have 10 possible moves and our opponent has three possible replies to all of them. All competitive chess games are timed. So if we were to spend 30 minutes on every move, we, would we wouldn't make it to the 14th move. We would run out of time and lose the game far before that. As a great Cuban world chess champion said when he was asked that famous question, how many moves do you see ahead? Only one, but it's the right one. What he was referring to is that chess players' intuitive senses are so strong that they can make really good decisions even without thinking, even just based on their default option. And that's because they spend so many hours studying chess and playing chess. And this intuitive sense is one of the reasons why chess players can play what we call simultaneous exhibitions. Here I'm playing a simul against a group of girls. That was a girls' chess class in San Francisco. And in a simultaneous exhibition, you kind of run around the room in a U, trying to checkmate everybody at once. It's usually very impressive to outsiders, but the truth is, the chess player is not really thinking very much in those games. Instead, they're kind of just moving their instincts. 
Now, somebody who's another chess master, in fact, I heard there's a grandmaster in the audience, were to sit down in the simul, of course then I'd have to think very hard or probably lose. I really like simultaneous exhibitions also because they highlight the physicality of chess. Normally when you watch two chess players play, all you see is somebody push a piece of wood forward every few minutes. But in reality, chess is totally exhausting. And this obsession I have with chess and movement came through in this piece where I'm hula hooping and playing chess at the same time, which I think I can make work. So here I am hula hooping and playing chess with my friend Gabrielle Reblock, who's also a professional dancer. The end of this game was interesting because I'm starting to check her with my rook, and she keeps moving her king back and forth, back and forth. We call this a perpetual chess. It's like a circular end to the chess game. It's also a draw. So if you think of this in terms of decision tree, it's like one long line followed by a circle. Infinite, but actually not that difficult to calculate because you're always going to be at one of a few points in the circle. One time I gave a simultaneous where I was also hula hooping, so I got to play 20 people at once and also get my daily workout in. Now, in poker, playing simultaneous games, or multi-tabling as we call it, is not just for fun or exhibitions. It's actually a key way for professional online poker players to make money. Here we have a poker pro who goes by the name Elke, and he's playing 62-game record-breaking session here. I'm sorry, 62 games of poker, all of those green ovals represent a different poker game. Just like in chess, poker players' default is so strong that they can beat players of a weaker level, even just playing on instincts. Sure, if he was to play just one game, he'd make better decisions in that game, but he wouldn't be taking that opportunity to multiply himself and therefore maximize his profits. So, Chess players and poker players can make good decisions, even without decision trees, even while hula hooping. But to be the best and to beat the best, we have to know when to hunker down and consider every possibility and counter. How can this apply to somebody who doesn't play chess or poker? Well, it's good to know when you should relax and use your intuition in life and when you should plot every counter and response, like, for instance, in a negotiation how to know that this day or this meeting or this chess move is special, not like other days or meetings or chess moves. One famous Hungarian-American grandmaster, Paul Benko, talked in his autobiography about a major life decision gone wrong. He was on his way home from a chess tournament in West Berlin, and he had the idea to defect from communist Hungary. He went to the US consulate in West Berlin, unfortunately, a few minutes after closing time. Hadn't thought this through too well, he later wrote. Things got even worse when he ran into an East German sports official at the train station who figured out what he was up to. Benko was arrested and sent to prison. Some years later, he got another opportunity, and this time he was more deliberate. He was playing in a chess tournament where first prize was a qualification to another chess tournament in Soviet Russia. Second prize qualified him to a chess tournament in Ireland. He made very sure to get second place exactly, and he ended up making his way to a U.S. embassy and obtaining American citizenship. So a decision tree well-crafted the second go-around. So how does a chess player know that a critical moment is coming up? Part of it is intuition from playing so many games and studying so many games. Yeah, you use intuition to figure out where you don't want to use intuition anymore. And then there's also concrete clues. For instance, maybe your opponent's king is in the center of the board. There are no pawns protecting it. Or maybe there's a lot of chess pieces in the center and they're all attacking each other. These are clues that your 14th move might be upon you. So the question we should ask somebody, like our charismatic new world champion, Magnus Carlsen, is not how do you think so hard or how do you defeat Bill Gates so quickly? But rather, how do you decide when to think hard? How do you know when it's your 14th move? Thank you.
Now I know that some decision trees in the audience lit up, <laughs> right? And some of you think that maybe you can take her on. Should we tell them what we're gonna do? Yeah, let's do it. At lunchtime, we're laying out five chess boards for any of you that wish to take her on, and she's gonna play all of you at the same time. I should add, I was looking at the badges. Someone wrote chess grandmaster. So if any of you wanna take on Jen, Except him. Time. Except him, yes. <laughs> He's going to have an accident. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>